Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Benbrook United Methodist Church. It's a joy and a pleasure to see all of you out here. This second Sunday is Easter. Uh, as we say in the church, Easter is a season, uh, not just a day. And so we are in the season of Easter. Uh, note the white cloth pyramids behind me and uh, white, so hence Easter. Um, there are a few very important announcements that we have that we want to bring to you. Uh, you may have had the chance to read your email this uh, morning, um, and if not, that's okay. You may have heard via word of mouth. We are, on April the 25th, going to be moving back into the sanctuary. So, yay! Yay! So, uh, so we'll be moving back in the sanctuary. Part of that is because um, uh, we have revised guidelines. Instead of six feet, it's three feet now, according to um, CDC, especially with, with children. And so uh, undergoing that three-foot guideline, we are able to all meet uh, in the sanctuary. So, um, and I know uh, if you haven't already, I encourage you to go get your vaccine. Um, but uh, as we continue to get more and more vaccinated, it becomes more and more a possibility that we can do more and more things. Um, so we've had discussions about Sunday school starting back up pretty soon here. Uh, we'll have more word about that. Um, and then also we have on the uh, Memorial Day uh, weekend, it will be our, where's Kay? Kay, where are you? Kay's not here. Okay. Uh, Kay? Okay's back there. Kay? Okay. Kay, did you want to say a little bit about um, about Memorial Day weekend and our, our luncheon? Oh, well, we're going to have victory luncheon. A victory luncheon. Memorial Day weekend. That's good. Because we can be together again. Yes. Amen. Amen. And I thought about having the victory luncheon in the sanctuary since we've opened it back up, but I've been assured I should stay in the CLC for that. <laughs> So you win some, you lose some. Um, and also a few other things uh, starting back up. Uh, preschool, uh, we have uh, proved uh, to meet back starting in the fall. And so uh, we have several of our teachers already on board and are now accepting students. So spread the word. Uh, three and four-year-olds we are looking for for the fall. Uh, if you know any, uh, please uh, let us know. And we hope to, to sign those up here in the next few weeks. Um, also, looking forward um, going into um, into the rest of uh, this month, there will be some takedown involved in some of the stuff here, um, and so you might hear more word about that from Matt or myself uh, in terms of, you know, we've got to move the, the stage out and we've got to move this back, and I don't know if you know, but in the back there, there's a huge bar uh, between the two doors that has to be physically removed in order to get the altar uh, through here, so it's not exactly an easy task, but we can do it. So, um, so there are a few logistics and so just kind of keep your eyes and ears peeled. Uh, there may be some more information on how to help uh, in terms of making that transition. But we are excited. We really are to get back uh, and grateful. Um, of course, we continue to have our Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, that's on the book of Romans. We're in chapter 4 this week. encourage you to come out uh, to that, uh, Zoom. Um, other stuff that we have going on, uh, we of course have uh, Frances, I know she's doing uh, Bible study at her house uh, this Friday, this upcoming Friday, so um, note that at 1 o'clock. So um, I did get that time right, didn't I, Tammy? 1 o'clock, okay, all right, just checking. Uh, other, other announcements that we have I might have missed? Okay, yes. Wednesday is doing a fundraiser like we have done with the church before. Mm -hmm. at Okay. And if you go in and mention West Day, they'll get a percentage of what you buy or, or the, what you pay. Okay. okay. Fundraiser for West Day next Thursday, April the 22nd, and it is at On the Border. And so a, a portion, like 10 or 15 percent, something like that, 20 percent? Okay. 20 percent goes to, goes to West Aid. So help that critical ministry. Yes, Jim. Okay. 
Um, so continue to, to, to support this important ministry um, and continue to stay tuned for further updates and details. We will have more as the, as the weeks kind of unfold, as more things kind of begin to open up. So um, let us go to God now in a word of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we come before you, grateful for this time together, grateful for our chance to sing praises to you in song and in word and in deed, in thought and in action, in the many ways that we know we are called to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Show us what it means to be community, a new, renewed in this season of Easter, in this time of resurrection. Lord, we pray that your mighty hand would be upon us and that you would lift up the downtrodden, lift up all those who are fallen, lift up all those who are discouraged, those who are in need of healing, those who are facing surgery and recovery, those who are at home this morning, those who are unable to be out for one reason or another. We pray for your peace to fall on all and for the peace of Jerusalem to be present now and forevermore. Lord, come into our hearts and teach us the prayer that you taught your disciples together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Over the course of these next uh, few Sundays, um, we are gonna be talking about the nature of community. What is community? What does it look like? How has it changed? How is it different? How is it the same? Um, kind of just addressing the issue of community. Um, as we go into this Easter time and this Easter season and we're resurrection people, as we are getting back into our sanctuary and getting back uh, into something that resembles normal, I guess, uh, we wanna ask the question, what, what is our community? Uh, you know, versus what it was before, what it is now, what it might be. Um, how are we going to tackle the issue of community? Because community is so key. It's so important. It is so essential. Um, in, um, in and throughout the gospel of, um, I'm sorry, not the gospel, but in and throughout um, Acts, um, that church, that early church was a community, uh, and how they were a community together um, through strength uh, and through times of tribulation, uh, through um, all of the difficulties that they tackled together, um, they really were a community. Um, and I've been reading up in Acts, and uh, while we're not going to talk in Acts today, um, we're actually going to be uh, in the precursor to Acts, which is Luke's gospel. I did want to talk about uh, community by way of asking a very simple question, an important question, a question that we have surely asked before, but just one that we always need to be asking ourselves. And who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? And of course, I want to look in Luke's gospel in chapter 10 and hear now these words. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. 
But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied. He replied in this way by telling him what Jesus does so well, by telling a parable. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came near. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, into this day and into this time and into this very moment, you carve out the beauty and the splendor of your creation as we bear witness to it in word and in song and in deed, in prayer and in thought, in all that we are and all that we have. We are grateful to be here together this morning in this house of worship. Lord, as we gather together, as we sing your praises, we remember your truth and we are reminded of your desire that we be in community, that as the risen Lord is present, so Lord, you are risen in our community and in our lives. Remind us anew of who our neighbor is this day. May my words not be my own, but may they be yours. May my mind not be my own, but may it be yours. Most of all, sweet Holy Spirit, may my heart not be my own, but may it be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. So, as we look at this scripture passage in, in Luke's gospel, we get a lawyer who stands up to test Jesus. Um, and you can kind of, uh, I think we all kind of have a certain... Uh, we hear the word lawyer, and uh, for a lot of us, it probably, you know, kind of makes the hair stand on edge, maybe. We have, we have certain opinions of lawyers. Um, now, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just saying we have certain opinions of lawyers. Um, but we certainly see they have the ads on TV, and they're kind of everywhere. There are shows about lawyers, and most of the time the shows about lawyers are about lawyers who are lawyers behaving badly. Um, uh, I just got done reading a uh, John Grisham novel, um, and of course the lawyer in that particular one behaved badly, um, ran off with some money and whatever else. And, um, but, but here, this is a lawyer who knows his stuff. This is a lawyer who understands. This is a lawyer who gets it. This is a lawyer who has it memorized. Um, because as he stands up to test Jesus, um, he, he asks him, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, and it's not so much that he's searching, but he's having this battle of wits with Jesus. And as he's having this battle of wits with Jesus, Jesus is the one who always uh, flips it on its head. Um, Jesus is really good about using kind of the Socratic method of uh, you ask a question and, uh, of me and then I turn around and I ask the question of you. Um, if people tell you uh, what would Jesus do, um, an appropriate response would be, well, I don't know, you tell me, what do you think Jesus would do? 
Jesus, Jesus, in response to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, says to them, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He pushes back on him. You say you have knowledge. You're challenging my knowledge. First, let's see your knowledge. Let's see what you bring to the game. Let's see what it is that you know. Let's see what it is that you learned in Shul. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. So he knows the answer, right? He's got it up here. He's memorized it, just like many Jews of the day understood and memorized the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. And it goes on from there. This understanding of the greatest commandment and a second is like it. He would have known. But his knowledge is not necessarily any better than anyone else's. He's just able to recite it. You know, just because someone is able to have the knowledge does not necessarily mean that they have the wisdom, right? Just because someone can speak it, just because someone can, can, can say it, just because someone uh, has it filed away, they've got a great memory or whatever, that doesn't necessarily mean that they believe it and they live into it. There's a difference between having the knowledge, between saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and believing you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is focused on the second. The scribe has come to him with the knowledge, but Jesus is concerned with the wisdom. Jesus is concerned with the practical application of the knowledge in such a way that he will leave a changed person. Because that is what always happens, isn't it? In the gospel, time and time again, when people come to Jesus one way, they always leave changed by the experience. You don't ever see somebody go to Jesus one way and walk out the same. Now they might walk out disappointed, they might walk out like the rich man crying and weeping because they have too many possessions and they can't get rid of them, but they never leave the same way that they come in. Jesus always changes people and Jesus always seeks to change us. If we get to the point where we are comfortable in our faith, then maybe we're not letting Jesus encounter us as much as we should. You have given the right answer, do this and you will live. Pats him on the back, says you can go home now. Because that's what you wanted, right? You wanted the answer. You wanted to feel verified in front of me and in front of everybody around me. You wanted to be able to get the attention and the praise. You wanted to be able to get the gold star. You wanted to get all of that attention. And you got it. You can go home now. But wanting to justify himself, meaning at this point, wanting to elevate himself, wanting to put himself above Jesus which is a big no-no. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And again, Jesus doesn't give an exact answer. At first, he tells a parable that leads into a question. But see, the, the lawyer is not concerned, the scribe is not concerned with you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He's got that. He's like, okay, I know how to do that. It's the and your neighbor as yourself that I've got some concerns about. It's not that he can't love God, but he has to figure out how he's got to do it in community. He's got to figure out how he's got to love his neighbor as much as he loves himself. And so Jesus tells this parable, and he tells the parable of uh, the Good Samaritan, right? The one that we're all really familiar with. He tells the parable of how uh, the man is beat up, 
And he's left uh, on the side of the road, half dead. And I love that expression. It says that he is left half dead, not all the way dead. All the way dead, what would be the purpose, what would be the point? But half dead, meaning that half of him could come back to life if the right person shows up along the side of the road. But the man is half dead, and then you have the Levite, and you have the priest, who are also half dead. Because they are walking through life with the knowledge. The same knowledge that the lawyer, the scribe had, but they don't have the heart. They haven't applied it. They don't have the wisdom. They haven't applied it. They know what it is that they are supposed to do. They know the rules. You're not supposed to uh, touch something that might be a corpse. No, you're supposed to stay away from it. You're supposed to, to go the other way. And, and you just, it's questionable. It's very, very risky behavior to engage in that. And besides, I might have had something else to do. I can't set aside this extra time. I'll have to go out and be ritually cleansed. It's gonna take several days in order to get clean again. I, I, we, we can't risk it. The Levite and the priest have the knowledge, but they don't have the heart. They don't have the wisdom to apply the knowledge in the way that Jesus is asking of the scribe, that Jesus is asking of the lawyer. But it takes a Samaritan, it takes the other, right? It takes the other guy, the one that is despised by Jews, the one who is seen as worshiping on the wrong mountain, the wrong place, that doesn't get it, that doesn't have the right knowledge. It takes the one that has the quote unquote wrong knowledge of the scriptures to show what it is to live it out with heart and with wisdom. To show what it means to love the neighbor as the loved oneself. He does all of these things, right? He finds him, he bandages his wounds, he pours oil and wine on them, he puts him on his own animal, he takes him to the inn, he gives the innkeeper two denarii, he says, anymore, I'll repay you uh, when I come back. He stays with him overnight to make sure that he doesn't die in the process before he leaves. He does all of these things over and above and beyond. It's not that the Samaritan didn't have other stuff to do, right? He was on the road just like they were. He had every bit as much of an intention of getting from point A to point B. It's not like all of a sudden the Samaritan didn't have a, a, a reason. It was just kind of ambling down the road. The Samaritan had every bit of wit and was supposed to do his own thing, but chose to give up of himself so that he could love his neighbor. And maybe part of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is that we love with the same passion that we love ourselves, but maybe also part of it is that we love ourselves less so that we see ourselves in our neighbor more. When Jesus asked the lawyer, when Jesus asked the scribe, so Tell me, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy. Which is so revealing. He doesn't say it was the Samaritan because he can't bring himself to say it was a Samaritan. He says, the one. But he also says the one, as in there's only one that is showing him mercy. The other two had left him, continued to leave him half dead and had walked half dead through their life. But precisely because this man chose to give, give of his life to this man on the side of the road, he went from being half dead 
to half alive. He gave of his own self so that life could come, so that resurrection could come in this very strange but very revealing way. And the question that is asked, who is my neighbor, is the one who showed him mercy. But it is the other that we often fail to show mercy to. It is the one who is unlike us, not the one who is like us. We got that down. My son and I were talking about Pokemon on the way over this morning. Something we share in common, some interests that we share in common. But rather than talking about Pokemon, what if we were to try and talk with people who didn't know anything about Pokemon? What about if we were to talk about stuff with people that we had no idea what was going on? And it involved us having to do more listening than talking, having us to not spout wis knowledge, but to spout wisdom of the heart. Who is my neighbor? It's not just the person that is next door to you. Although if that's the case, then the Jews and the Samaritans should be better neighbors because they are next door to each other. But the neighbor is the person who is most unlike you. If you are old, then it's someone who's young. If you're young, it's someone who's old. If you're black, it's someone who's white. If you're male, it's someone who's female. Find your list of opposite and go for that person and seek to love that person as your neighbor. There is nothing wrong with loving your neighbor who's next door that you relate to, certainly. But how are we really challenging ourselves and how are we really pushing ourselves and how are we really engaging in the work of the gospel if we are not intentionally seeking out those who are dislike us? How are we pushing ourselves? so that we can grow as God has called us to grow. Because there might actually be more of us half dead on the side of the road than we're aware of. There might be more of us that have more growing pains left to do. You know, my dad, my grandfather, uh, we had this, uh, we have this uh, conversation almost every time uh, that, that we meet. You know, he's 100 now. He says, well, you know, I've done my work in the church. I say, you don't get off the hook. No one gets off the hook. As long as you are following after Jesus Christ, you are called to love your neighbor just as much as you love yourself. You're not called to rest. You're called to provide rest for the other. That is love. And if you help the other person up, something crazy happens. You see part of yourself in them. And you can't hate them or dislike them or distance yourself from them because you have created this bond with each other. But maybe that was never the point all along, to be us versus them. That's certainly what our world has preached, but that's not what Jesus preaches. If we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, then we are to show mercy for the other. So this week, I encourage you as you seek to build community anew here in and around Benbrook and in your work and in your home life and with your family, think about the person that is most dislike you. Think about the person that is most different from you and engage with that person. You will discover something about yourself 
in the process, and you may just grow in grace and mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we gather before this feast, there are people who are partaking of this meal today that are the other, that are the neighbor, that are the stranger and the orphan and the widow, that are unlike us rather than like us. Envision that. Imagine that as you feast at the Lord's Supper. But it's not just the people you know, but it's those that you may never meet, but which you are called to be a neighbor to, just the same. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May you go forth from this place, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and yes, your neighbor as yourself. Go forth in Jesus' name. Amen.